How are y'all doing? Do you know it dawned on me this week? We only meet three more times. Does that freak out anybody but me? It's like, oh no, Lord, please let me be saying everything that I want to say. I'm so scared I'm going to leave something out. So I probably will because that's my MO apparently. I always forget to say something. So probably within the couple of weeks after this class is over, make sure that you check the website and then that's where I will go and write down everything I forgot. Good deal? So <laughs> it's true, it's so sad. Every time when I go home on Monday nights, I'm laying in bed and it's inevitable. I wake up and go, dang it, forgot something else. Do you all remember uh, the first week that we met, maybe it was the second, when I told you all that I was um, sort of kind of a Kentucky basketball fan? Okay, a huge Kentucky basketball fan. Do y'all remember me telling you that? I get it honest, my mom is a huge Kentucky basketball fan and she passed it on to me and my brother and my brother passed it on to my nephew and now it is my nephew's job to pass it on to my great niece. She's eight years old, her name's Sophie. She's adorable. This past Monday while we were meeting, my nephew took my niece, my great niece, she is a great niece, that makes me a great aunt by the way. Uh, she got to go to her very first UK basketball game. And I brought a picture. I pulled it off Facebook, so y'all aren't going to be able to see it very clear. But check her out in her little Kentucky jersey. Isn't that sweet? Okay, here's the deal. Y'all, her first game ever, it was a smackdown. I brought an article because I wanted to read a few things for you. The name of the article was 10 Startling Stats from Kentucky's 80 five point exhibition victory. Love it. Listen to this paragraph. Division two Morehouse, Col Morehouse College was on the receiving end, are you ready for it, <laughs> of a 125 to 40 shellacking <laughs> that in many ways was even more one-sided than the final score suggests. Kentucky led by 10 after less than two minutes by 20 after less than six minutes, and by 50 with less than six minutes still to go before halftime. It almost makes you feel sorry for the other team, doesn't it? <laughs> Maybe just a little bit, but I thought, you know, and I said those teams sign up for the exposure. Why in the world would you want that kind of exposure? I haven't figured it out yet. But I got to thinking about it this week. What an awesome experience for my great niece, her very first basketball game. And we smoked them. Now she knows forever what the Wildcats are capable of doing, right? So when the season gets a little bit tougher, and it will, I wish that it wouldn't, but it will, and we start playing harder, bigger, badder teams, and we have to start playing better, and we have to start playing harder. She's going to know, though, that it is possible that we can win. And that's something. Isn't that exactly what God did with the Israelites? They witnessed, shellacking is my new favorite word. They witnessed a shellacking of the enemy. They saw the plagues, and then when God brought them out, they watched the, the Red Sea split, and they walked through on dry ground. We studied all of this. They saw it with their own eyes. So when the heat got turned up in the desert and the enemy got a little bit closer, they knew, or at least they should have known because they had witnessed it with their own eyes. They knew what God was capable of doing. Are we doing that? Because listen, when what we've seen all of this as we've been studying together. Like a few weeks ago, we, we looked at Jesus as our Passover lamb, and we know that he forgave us of all of our sins. And then we saw him as the scapegoat. Was that last week? And time, time's running like this. I can't, I, what, what day is it? But we saw how uh, Jesus took away our sin. As far as the east is from the west, scripture says, God has so far removed our transgressions from us. We know what he did on the cross. We know what he did for us. So when the enemy gets close to us, we should know that he is well capable of shellacking the enemy, right? We need, thank you, amen, all right. I was having a good time with that this week. I'm like, Lord, you are good. So last week, we looked at the desert of guilt and shame. And oh, oh, I so pray that that was a truth that some of you all needed to hear and that it set you free for the rest of your life. If that happened to you, please come talk to me. I want to hear your stories. I want to hear your stories. Tonight, as promised, we are going to be looking at a different type of desert. And I believe that I mentioned it last week. We are going to be looking at the desert of sin. And this is another, it's a, it's a desert and it's 
it's a lot different than the desert of guilt and shame. Guilt and shame, and I don't want to make it sound like it's easy, but it's one of those, I can remember what to do when the enemy throws my past at me in the desert of guilt and shame. And I can remember that I need to open my mouth and I need to start praising God. The desert of sin is a little bit more complicated because whew, the enemy gets in there and he convinces you that you have no power whatsoever to get out of this desert on your own. And truth be known, you can't get out of it on your own. God is faithful. Let me pray one more time before we get into the word. God, I, I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you that, that your holy presence is already in this room with us tonight, Lord. And actually, we're just coming into your presence. God, I pray that you will open our ears and that you will open our hearts and that your word, Lord, that you promise will not return to you empty, that your word will pierce us and that we will be changed. God, I pray that because you are a God that, that wants to be experienced, that we will experience you tonight, Lord, in ways that maybe we have never experienced before. God, I thank you. I thank you for your faithfulness, Lord, and I thank you for the women in this room and their, their willingness to come week after week to hear what you would have to say to them from your word. God, you are amazing and you are beautiful, and I worship you in this moment. It's in your sweet name that I pray. Amen. There are so many things that I hope and pray that you ladies, uh, that it's just getting into your bones, that you will remember for the rest of your life when we have ended this study together. And some of those things you've heard me say them a million times, I'll probably continue to repeat myself until the end of the semester. One of them is that your God sees you and that your God hears you. Not only does your God see you and hear you, but he is a God that wants to be seen and he wants to be heard and he wants that intimacy with you. But it requires something on our, our behalf, and that is obedience. And I believe the phrase that we used over and over one week was that obedience precedes intimacy with God. I hope that you ladies remember that God absolutely, some point in your life, will lead you to something impossible so that you will experience Him do the impossible in your life. A few weeks ago, we encountered Jesus as our Passover lamb and what that meant for us and the forgiveness of sins that he offers to us. Then we encountered Jesus as our scapegoat. That was huge for me. I don't know about y'all. Maybe I got a past like y'all don't have, but I need to know that Jesus has taken my sins away from me. Woo! Thank you, Lord. Tonight, woo, here's where we're going tonight. We are going to encounter Jesus as our high priest. And what that means for us, I've got your key point that you're going to want to write down tonight. Because this is what it all centers around. Jesus didn't just die for the forgiveness of our sin. He rose for our victory over the power of sin. Let me say it again. Jesus didn't just die for our forgiveness of sin. He rose for our victory over the power of sin. And as I sat down this week to write this lesson, I, I asked myself, big picture, wh what do I need? What do we need? What do I need to know? And just like I just said, I, I need to know Jesus as my Passover lamb. I need to know that I am forgiven. And I need to know that my sins have been taken away from me. So I need to know Jesus as my scapegoat. Check on both of those. I also need to know, what about those sins that, that I feel like I am enslaved to, that I have tried and tried and tried to quit doing on my own, that I feel like I have no power over that? I need to know that that sin has no power over me. Anybody but me? Y'all need to know that? Then we need to know Jesus as our high priest. What was the job of the high priest? We've studied a lot of this in your homework. You all know by now that the high priest, he was uh, responsible for doing the daily sacrifices, and then he was responsible for a one time a year going behind the curtain into the Holy of Holies with the blood of the sacrifice. And it, he couldn't even uh, see the presence of God. Remember, he had to take the incense with him and slide it under the curtain so it would it would shield God's presence, if you will. But he was responsible for this. This is what the high priest did. But there was something not quite right with this system. 
consider, uh, for example, only one time a year could he go into the Holy of Holies, just one time a year. And even then, remember, they would tie a rope around his waist just in case he dropped dead so they could, they could yank him out. And he had to uh, not only, com um, I almost said commit, what's the word? Uh, perform, I can't think of the right word I want to use right now. He would do the sacrifices, and not only for the people, but for himself as well, because he sinned just like everybody else. So he, uh, let's see, what am I trying to say? When he would go into the, oh, and he would drop dead. That's what I didn't want to leave out. He would die. <laughs> That's a big one. He was human just like everybody else. So he would always need to be replaced. So this high priest system in the Old Testament, while it was good, it wasn't complete. And mind you, the Day of Atonement only covered their sins for that one day. And then if they were like me, by the end of that day, they'd already started racking them up again. And they had to, you know, it would last until the next 365 days when he would do it again. So this, the high priest, um, it was never quite fulfilled. There was always something lacking. He was not perfect. He wasn't perfect. Oh, Jesus is perfect. It doesn't feel very free to me. The system doesn't feel very free. In many ways, the Old Testament priesthood was, uh, it was a lot like the, the festivals and the feasts that we have studied. It pointed to something much greater. And we have seen in every instance, haven't we, how Jesus perfectly fulfilled all of the festivals and the feasts that we've studied. It's not a surprise to any of you tonight, I promise, I guess, if it is, raise your hand. It's not going to be a surprise to you that Jesus perfectly fulfilled the role of the high priest. Was anybody surprised by that statement? Yeah, I didn't think so. So there, um, there's a book in the, the New Testament, Hebrews. If you have not read Hebrews, oh, go back and read it. It's fascinating. And it has more information in it than any other book in the Bible about how Jesus is our high priest. And instead of reading to you for 45 minutes without stopping, I decided to pull out the high points for you all tonight. But let these sink in, and then we will hone in on a few of the really, really cool ones that God showed me this week. Fascinating stuff. Jesus is a merciful and high priest, and he made atonement for the sins of everyone. Remember, and I didn't say this earlier, the, the high priest in the Old Testament would be atoning for the sins only of the Israelites, only of God's chosen uh, children. Jesus made the atonement for everyone. Here, this will blow your mind. Past, present, and future. Everybody that will ever breathe. Jesus is our high priest, made atonement for all of us. Amazing. Because he took on flesh and became a man as our high priest, he is able to sympathize with our weakness because he was tempted in every way. But he didn't sin. Hang on to that word sympathize if you want to write it down. That's the word that we're going to be circling back around to in a minute. Blew my mind this week. Jesus as our high priest represents us in all matters relating to God. All matters. He offers gifts and sacrifices for our sins. Namely, he offered himself for us. Jesus is a high priest after the Old Testament Melchizedek, who was not only a priest but a king as well. I did some reading on this this week, thinking that this was going to be a big part of my lesson. Y'all, I'm not that smart. <laughs> okay, you can go back and read it for yourself, but there's um, quite a bit of information in Hebrews, actually, on how Jesus was a priest in the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek was uh, a king and a priest that showed up in, I believe it's, well, yeah, it was with Gen in Genesis with Abraham, and Abraham gave him a tenth of everything that he had. Uh, but the whole Melchizedek, it's pretty fascinating. But here's what we can get from that, that Jesus is not only our high priest, he's also our king. It's pretty cool. Uh, Jesus, as our high priest, is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. And he didn't need to keep offering sacrifices over and over and over like the high priest did because he offered once and for all himself. Amazing. So let's look a little bit closer at what Jesus does for us personally as our high priest. Look with me in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, 
yet was without sin. I want you all to hear the definition of sympathize. This is so cool. Now remember, Jesus is our high priest. We just read it. He is able to sympathize with us. Listen to what it means. It means to have compassion, to be touched with a feeling, to feel for, have compassion on, to suffer with, to share in suffering. But here's the point I do not want you to miss. To be affected with the same feelings of another. To be affected with the same feelings of another. The word weakness, that he can sympathize with our weakness. Weakness means incapacity or the state of weakness or limitation. Ladies, try to wrap your brain around this. Jesus, as our high priest, feels the same feeling that you do in the midst of your weakness. Does that blow your mind or what? So I ask you tonight, what is your weakness? Is it food? Addiction of some kind? Maybe an unhealthy relationship? Sex? You name it, what's your weakness? You have a high priest that feels the same way you do in the midst of your weakness. It's fascinating, isn't it? As I was studying that this week, I'm just, wow, Lord, how do you do that? It reminded me of something that you and I studied together, our very first lesson, and I want uh, put something in Hebrews because we're going to be back here, but I want you to flip all the way back to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3, starting in verse 7 to the first part of verse 8. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians. Look at that phrase, uh, concerned about their suffering. Listen to the definition of concern. It's the Hebrew word yada, and it means, oh, this is so cool. Okay, it means to perceive, to understand, to discern. Here's the kicker, to know by experience. God is telling Moses through the burning bush, remember that's the scene, that I've seen the people, I've heard them, I'm concerned about their suffering, meaning I've, I've experienced their suffering. How is that possible? Oh, let me say this first. I'm getting excited. Y'all, this blew my mind this week. In Revelation 13, 8, Scripture tells us that Jesus was the lamb slain before the creation of the world. Before the creation of the world, he was the lamb slain. My brain's about this big. <laughs> I can't comprehend that. Can y'all comprehend that? We can't. Our God is amazing, but somehow he is not confined to the time that he created. He's above it. He is at the very beginning and at the very end, all at the same time. So if Jesus is the lamb that is slain before the creation of the world, then it makes sense, doesn't it, that God could experience the suffering of the Israelites just the same way that Jesus can sympathize and feel the same feelings that we do in the midst of our weakness. Does that blow y'all away or what? Is our God not amazing or what? Here's what blew me away even more than all of that. What kind of God would choose to do that? Do you realize I say this to myself all the time. Actually, I say it to God. You don't have to be good. You're God. He's God and he chooses to be good. He chooses to love us. He chooses to feel what you feel. Whew. We could go home right now, couldn't we? I'm not done. The phrase come down, it means to go down, to descend, to sink, to go or to come down. 
You and I need to hear that literally because Jesus literally came down to rescue every single one of us. Every single one of us. And rescue, oh, this is fun. Rescue means to snatch away, to save, to deliver from our enemies, to deliver from sin and guilt. I have in my notes right here, holla, <laughs> woo, that is awesome. So picture it, our God came down to snatch us away in the midst of our weakness. Our God is good, Ooh, he's good. Oh, one more thing, in the hand of the Egyptians, the hand signifies strength and power. Yes, indeed, the enemy that uh, the enemy of our souls that wants to destroy us, you bet he's got strength and power. And some of you all know that firsthand because you're tangling with him tonight because you've got a sin in your life that you feel you are powerless to beat. He is no match for our God, no match. So we've seen so far that God is able to sympathize with us, with our Weakness just blows me away, Lord. I don't know why you would go there with me. Um, let's circle back around then to uh, the function of Jesus as our high priest. All right, this is awesome. It's making me happy. Look with me in Hebrews chapter 9 now. Hebrews 9, I'm going to read 11 through 14 and then jump down to 24. When Christ came as the high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, that is to say, not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and ashes of a heifer, does that sound familiar to you all now? sprinkled on those who are ceremonial, ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences, our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we might serve the living God? There's part of your divine purpose. Whew. Okay, jump down to, what did I say, 24 through 25. Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. What we've been studying in our homework, the tabernacle that the priest served in and that, that Moses gave the instructions for, that tabernacle, that was a copy of the true one that's actually in heaven. That's the tabernacle that Jesus went through after his death on the cross. Amazing. Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of a true one. He entered heaven itself now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Jesus literally entered into the holy of holies, into the very presence of of God, something that the high priest could only do one time a year, and that with the blood. And remember, he couldn't even see the presence of God. The incense had to cover it. Jesus, with his own blood, entered into the most holy place on our behalf. And he didn't just enter, he did something. Look with me, flip back over to chapter 8, verse 1. This is fun. 8.1. The point of what we are saying is this. Don't you love? I don't know who the writer of Hebrews is. I'm not sure anybody does, but I love the way he starts that. Look, the point is this. We do have such a high priest, here it is, who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not man. He sat down. He sat down. He sat down. Why is that important? Again, do you remember when the high priest would enter one time a year? He was only in there for a short time. What was the piece of furniture that was in the Holy of Holies behind that curtain? What was the piece of furniture? There's just one, right? 
there was not a chair in the Holy of Holies. He didn't get to spend a lot of time in there because the work was never finished ha, until Jesus walked in. It was finished and he sat down. Done. Oh, thank you. That's good stuff. It's good stuff. So what is he doing sitting at the right hand of the Father? I put in my notes, he's not just kicking it. He actually has a purpose. Aren't you glad I don't read my notes verbatim? Mm -hmm. Well, you should be <laughs> if you're not. Okay, so what does that mean for us uh, with Jesus as our high priest? Look back at chapter 7, verse 25. Is it hot in here or is it just me? Do y'all remember last week we were freezing in here? It's cold in here tonight. I'm not too young to have hot flashes. I'm just saying. Okay, 725. This is a fun one too. Here's what Jesus is doing as our high priest at this moment. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. That's what Jesus, as your high priest, is doing even now at this moment. He is at the, the right hand of the Father interceding for you and for me. So what does that mean exactly? The save completely, this is very fun. It means to preserve one who is in danger of destruction. Anybody ever know what it feels like to be in danger of destruction? We're caught in that cycle. Uh, I believe I mentioned it last week, the cycle that we get in of uh, sin, confess, sin, confess, and we feel like we're never gonna be able to get out. And it keeps getting worse and worse and worse, and we feel like we are on the brink of destruction. He is able to save you completely. Who does he save? He saves those who come to God. Jump back with me now to chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. I'm going to read them again. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. The phrase come to God and the word approach God, it's the same thing in the Greek. It's the same thing. Those who come to God are the same ones that can approach God. Do you all realize, let this blow your mind for a minute. Do you remember I love that word now. Do you remember when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies? I said this just a few minutes ago, and they would tie the rope around his waist just in case he accidentally touched something. So he was always, oh, I got to do everything just right. I got to do everything just right. That was the only time he could ever approach God. Do you realize that now, because of Jesus, we can freely approach the same living God with confidence? That's amazing. Listen to the uh, definition of confidence. This is fun. It means courage, boldness, frankness, freedom in speaking, cheerful courage, and unreservedness in speech. Y'all get that. When we approach God, we can speak to him freely. We don't have to worry about dropping dead for saying the wrong thing. In the midst of our weakness, and remember, Jesus feels what we feel in the midst of our weakness. You know how it feels. We have the freedom now to approach God and speak to him about how that feels. If that's not freedom, I don't know what is. We're a, we receive mercy. This is cool. This means acts which display one's fondness or compassion for another. Fondness, compassion. These are the things that we can expect to receive from God when we approach him boldly now. Not, oh, we're dead, pull him out. We don't have to worry about that. 
we're going to receive mercy and, and find grace. Listen to what to find means. To find means, oh, where is it? Oh, I don't want you to miss this. To find mercy begin. Oh, it means to experience. So when we find grace, it's something that we actually experience. This isn't something that we just, we get to read about. Oh, that sounds great. That's beautiful. No, we get to experience it personally. Personally. Amazing. Our God is amazing. So did you ever, ever, I didn't until this week, think about what it means to have Jesus as our high priest? Did it? I believe, in my own personal opinion, that one of the best examples of this, of what this looks like, how it plays out, is in Romans chapter 6. And I want you to turn there with me. Romans chapter 6. Uh, I really wanted to read the first 14 verses to y'all, but for the sake of time, I won't. So let's, let's hone in on two, two verses. The first one is uh, verse 6, Romans 6, 6. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, with Christ, so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Get this, girls. This is amazing. So what Paul is saying here is that our old self, meaning our old, before we came to Christ, our old sinful self has it's died with Christ and so that the body of sin might be done away with. When you hear body of sin, we're tempted to think physical body of sin. That's not what Paul's talking about here. It's, it's a phrase that means, uh, if I were to say to you, body of truth, then you would understand that as the totality of truth. Or if I were to say, uh, point to like a lake or something, I would say that body of water. Then you would understand that I'm talking about the totality of that. So what Paul is telling us here is that when we died with Christ, that our old self has been done away with. Are y'all hearing it? Our old self has been done away with. It's been done away with. And the body of sin, meaning the totality of sin, Oh, that's what's done away with, so that we should no longer be slaves to sin. When you're caught in that cycle, the sin confess, sin confess, do you not feel like a slave to it? Ladies, sometimes just hearing the truth is enough to set us free. Listen, it doesn't matter what's going on in your life, what sin has you feeling trapped tonight. God's word is telling us that that sin has no power over you. Makes you think it does, but it doesn't. I heard an illustration this past week uh, on, actually from James McDonald, just, just this past week. I thought, oh, how appropriate. So I'm going to use it tonight because it helped me understand a little bit. Have any of you all uh, ever rented before and had a nasty landlord? Anybody? You know what that feels like, you know, because this nasty landlord has a key. And he can come over anytime he wants, and he can uh, d demand crazy things from you. And you don't really have much of a choice because he owns your property. You have no rights to it. When we come to Christ, the old landlord is gone. He moves out. He has no power over us ever again. There is a new landlord. We do not have to be slaves to the power of sin. I just remembered something. Thank you, Lord. Look at this verse I read this morning. Look in Colossians. I don't know where it is. I have to look for it. Just hang on. Lord, help me find it. Colossians, Colossians, Colossians. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Lord. Here we go. It's Colossians 2, 13 through 15. Check this out. When you are dead in your sins and in the... Colossians 2, 13. 2.13. When you were dead in your sins, in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. Here's the part I want you to hear. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross. At the cross, Jesus disarmed the power of sin. Done. 
done away with. If I can use my word again, he shellacked the enemy at the cross. It was done away with. Are you all getting this? Are you starting to hear it? The power of sin has no authority over you as a believer in Christ. Absolutely no authority. There was one more verse that I wanted you to hear. It's consider yourself dead to sin but alive to God. This is back in Romans 6, verse 11. The information that we're hearing tonight, the information is not enough to set you free. You have to consider yourself dead to sin. Consider it. Consider it. There are three steps that I want to leave you all with tonight that will help break this cycle of sin confess, sin confess, sin confess. We, we want out of the desert of sin. Whoo, Lord, we want out of the desert of sin. The first thing, this is not your first step. Uh, this is pre-step number one. We have to determine that we are going to stand on the truth of God's word, ladies, period. It always comes down to a, um, do I believe God or do I not believe God, period. We always have to say, absolutely, Lord, I am going to trust you. I am going to stand on your word as truth, yes? The first thing that we have to do, ladies, is confession. And already some of you all are thinking, Paul and I do that. Uh, okay, let's, let's make sure that we understand what confession is not. Confession is not coming to the Lord and saying, Lord, I did it again, I'm sorry. That's not confession. Confession is not, dear Lord, please forgive me for all my sins. That is not confession. Confession, let me read the definition of confession to you. It means to speak the same, and it means to agree. Here's what confession is, and it will curl your hair when you start to practice it. When we, become, when we come into the presence of God, and remember, we can approach him boldly with confidence now because Jesus lives to intercede for us. Remember, he feels what you feel. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget that he feels what you feel. When you come and you begin to say to God, uh, speak to him the same thing that God sees about your sin, it will change the way you feel about it. When you begin to speak truth, we know how God feels about sin, but there are some sins that he is very specific about in scripture. When you begin to recite those back to him, Lord, you, I know that you hate this. You love me. You love me, but you hate what this sin is doing to me. And when we begin to confess those things, it will lead to the next step, which is repentance. And I think that word does not get used enough in our Christian circles today. Frankly, it's one of my favorite words because it is such a gift, ladies. Look with me over in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Second Corinthians seven verse ten. This is one of those that needs to be underlined in my opinion. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. Sorrow means just exactly what you think it does. It means regret, sadness, a state of unhappiness marked by regret. Repentance means a change of mind which results in a change of lifestyle. Repentance, a change of mind which results in a change of lifestyle. Worldly sorrow, on the other hand, worldly is, it's, uh, it just means the, the worldly system of things. Um, just, you know, I'm, I'm sorry I got caught kind of a feeling. Uh, this type of sorrow, it leads to death. And it, this is going to send chills down your spine. It did mine. Listen to this definition of death in this context. It's the misery of soul arising from sin which begins on earth but lasts and increases after the death of the body in hell. Isn't that creepy? Case in point, godly sorrow, worldly sorrow, Peter and Judas. You all know the story. Both of these men walked with Jesus for three years. Both of these men denied him on the last night of his death. Peter experienced godly sorrow, and we see that because it was a change of lifestyle for him, a huge lifestyle change for him. 
Judas, on the other hand, we know what happened. It was worldly sorrow. Oh, he felt bad, all right, but it did not lead to repentance, and it ended in literal death for him. Huge difference. Step number two was repentance. Step number three. James 5.16 says this, Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you might be healed. Step number three is confess your sins and your struggles to another person. I'm going to lose some of you all on this one. I know it because already you're thinking, uh, Paulette, no way am I about to tell somebody else what I'm struggling with because it's ugly and it's dark and I can barely even bring myself to talk about it with myself, let alone tell somebody else what I'm dealing with. I don't believe that what James is talking about in this context is public confession. I don't. I believe that there is a time and place for that, but I don't believe that it's all the time. And I promise you, I am not opening up the floor tonight for public confession. We are not going there tonight. I do believe what he is saying is that it is imperative for believers to have an accountability partner where you can freely share your struggles and your weaknesses with them so you can pray for one another. This does several things, ladies. A couple of things I could think of. Uh, one of them is when we actually confess to another person what we're dealing with, it brings our weaknesses and our struggles out of the darkness and into the light. If the enemy can keep you from confessing what you're dealing with, chances are he's going to keep his grip on you in that area of your life. But when you've got a good girlfriend that you can share these things with and you all can pray together over it, it's amazing what God will do. It's amazing. I know. Plus, it's really, really helpful when we have somebody to keep us accountable and ask us, hey, how's that going for you? Hmm. Yeah. The last thing I want to do tonight, ladies, is leave you with the feeling uh, kind of like I did last week. Woohoo, I can go home and this is going to, I'm done. I can get out of the desert of sin tonight. You may, you may. I'm definitely not saying that that is not possible. God can do anything. But this one, this type of desert takes perseverance. Because, man, when the enemy gets a foothold on you and he's got you in an area, it, it takes such determination and such perseverance to stand on the truth of God's word, to remember who Jesus is as your high priest and, and that he shellacked the enemy. He has no power over you. So don't quit. Don't quit. Listen, whatever your weakness is, when you're facing it, the next time, will you please take time to have a conversation with your high priest? He is right there. No matter where it is, if it's in the middle of the night standing in front of the refrigerator, your high priest is there. If it's in the car on the way to the liquor store, he's there. If it's at night when nobody else is around with a razor blade, he is there. Your high priest is there. There's one picture I want to leave you all with before we end tonight. This week in your homework, I asked you, to read the ending of a story of Korah and his followers. Remember these guys? They're the ones that uh, came against Moses and they wanted to gather a bunch of people together and for heaven's sake head back to Egypt. If you remember, it didn't end so well for them. Do you all remember that? I want you to turn with me to, to Numbers chapter 16. starting in verse 41. And this is after God had dealt with Korah and his little posse. 41. The next day, the whole Israelite community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. You've killed the Lord's people, they said. But when the assembly gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron and turned toward the tent of meeting, suddenly the cloud covered it and the glory of the Lord appeared. Then Moses and Aaron went to the front of the tent of meeting, and the Lord said to Moses, Get away from this assembly so I can put an end to them at once. <laughs> and they fell face down. Then Moses said to Aaron, Take your censer and put incense in it along with fire from the altar and hurry to the assembly to make atonement for them. Wrath has come out from the Lord. The plague has started. 
So Aaron did as Moses said and ran to the midst of the assembly. The plague had already started among the people, but Aaron offered incense and made atonement for them. This is what I don't want you to miss. He stood between the living and the dead. Ladies, your high priest stands between you and that which can kill you. Aaron had fire from the altar, which represented the forgiveness. And he had uh, incense, which represented the prayers that go up to God. And he stood between the living and the dead, and it stopped it. So imagine the next time you are in the midst of your weakness. Your high priest, Jesus, runs and stands between you and that which can kill you. We have an amazing high priest, don't we? Will you all stand with me? I want to pray over you all tonight. Lord God Almighty, we love you. Thank you for your presence in this room, Lord. I thank you for your word. Lord, it pierces my heart constantly. And God, I am stunned that you would live to intercede for me. Lord, I am stunned that you would feel what I feel. What a loving and amazing God you are. Lord, I pray that you will that your presence will be known in this room tonight. Lord, I pray for every single woman here and women that are listening. God, I pray that you will speak to us because, Lord, we have already, we, we know now that you are a God that wants to be heard. God, I pray that we will see you, that we will see you run in between um, that which, oh, God, our enemy that wants to kill us, Lord, but you can stop it. If we will just believe, Lord, I pray for a spirit of belief in this room. I, I pray for a conviction where it needs to be. And Lord, I pray for um, a sense of urgency to deal with whatever we need to deal with. Tonight, Lord, every change begins with the decision to change. And Lord, if there are decisions that need, need to be made tonight, I pray that they will be. God, open our eyes that we will begin to see your son, Jesus, in ways that we have never seen him before. Lord, you are our high priest. You are our Passover lamb. Lord, you are our scapegoat. You are amazing. You're amazing. God, we love you. We worship you in this moment. It is in your precious almighty name that I pray. Amen.